present here and now and in the awareness of God's presence. Let us pray. Father, Mother, God, we give thanks for this opportunity to be open to the awareness of your presence. As we allow ourselves this receptivity, we feel you as gratitude. We feel you as love, unconditional love. As we rest in the awareness of your presence. Peace abides, a peace that passes all understanding. As we rest with you in our awareness, we feel transformed, lifted, healed. For this we give thanks. So it is that together we say, Amen. Yes, uh, take this one off, this one below. Oh, yeah, Mark will do it. Thank you. <coughs> so. Indra's net on steroids. How many of you are familiar with Indra's net? Okay. A couple of you. Okay. Well, we're going to explore this idea of interconnectedness and consciousness. Um, this, is, this is not to fill you with fun facts, but rather it's to give you an appreciation of a different perspective that will hopefully, give you uh, great cause uh, for the appreciation of each and every person in your experience. And you might even come to the realization that it's not just the people in your experience, but the experience itself, the appreciation of the experience itself. Because the, the experience itself <laughs> the experience itself is a combination. It's a combina It's a relationship with all aspects of your perceptive awareness, your awa your knowledge, your intellectual awareness. And uh, I I just saw someone go flailing by <laughs> the window. <laughs> Apparently, they met up with those aspects of the experience out there that have stingers on them. Um, so I, I hope there are. Oh, it was Doug. <laughs> he, he passed by the window so quickly I, I didn't recognize him. Okay. So uh, <coughs> so this, this concept of Indra's web is a concept that arises out of Buddhist philosophy. And it is um, a... Uh, a representation of several principles of B Buddhist philosophy. One is emptiness. The other is co-arising or, or dependent arising, dependent origination. That is, all things arise together, not just individually, but it, 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 uh, uh, it emphasizes that all of creation is codependent. Um, I know that's a bad word in relationship terms, that, but all aspects of, of creation are dependent upon each other. Uh, and, and so this principle of emptiness and origi uh, uh, dependent origination or co-origination and uh, interconnectedness, 
are represented in this concept of Ender's Web. And if we take a look at the image that has been depicted of Ender's Web, no, 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 must be. Did you get, okay. Yeah, it, it should be the one uh, labeled B. Could you, uh, could, could you look for that, please? Because those, those additions are uh, useful. So this um, Indra's web is a web of relationships with each intersection of the web representing a sentient being. And that sentient being is shown in Indra's web as a jewel, as a multifaceted jewel. And each jewel reflects all of the other jewels in this network, in this net. And so this, this, uh, struct, this web structure is one that represents all sentient beings, and it also represents the relationship between all sentient beings, with each sentient being being a reflection of all other sentient beings. Okay, so uh, all conscious beings are are in intimate relationship with each and every other being. And this uh, depiction of uh, Indra's net is that it is uh, it it represents emptiness in that the spaces between e the nodes of this network are empty. That it represents a co-arising or a co-origination because the web exists as a web, as a net. It exists because all of it exists. That is, there is no part of it that is late coming. It all arose at the same time. And this um, interconnectedness, the, the reflection of this thank you, this, uh, the interconnectedness uh, of each of these sentient beings is part and parcel of this Buddha philosophy of emptiness, interconnectedness, and codependent arising. So this is a depiction of consciousness, okay? as opposed to a depiction of the physical realm. However, if we look at this and we compare this to the physical realm, the physical realm is, am I connected? Do we have our dongle connected here? Okay, there it is. So this is <coughs> an image of the universe on a scale of a billion light years. And this is a, a, a realization that has just come about in the last 30 or 40 years <coughs> of the uh, study of the neighborhood. And the neighborhood being, if you will, a billion light years across. So the idea then is that our galaxy is actually one of these pixels in this network and that the common position in the network, the uh, in the universe, the average position in the network using our own human eyes is darkness. That is to say that we see things out there because we are in a galaxy. But have you ever seen the Andromeda galaxy, the ne nearest one, with your naked eye. It's only two million light years away. The, the space in between in this network is so far away from the nearest galaxy <laughs> that we cannot see them with our human eye, okay? So, <coughs> so we see here in the physical depiction of the universe based upon observational study is that <coughs> the universe is empty. And there are a few places where there are accumulations of matter. 
music stands, chairs, you and I, galaxies, stars. Well, okay, so there may be some relationship, maybe not, but I thought it was interesting to compare what our universe looks like versus what this concept of the interconnectedness of consciousness is like. So we're talking about consciousness here, not on the physical plane, but on the mental plane. One of the interesting things that I have found about consciousness, and certainly it is of interest to many philosophers, is that consciousness is difficult to explain. Neil deGrasse uh, Tyson, uh, who is the curator at the uh, New York Planetarium, and you've probably seen uh, Tyson on many different talk shows, he offered us this. Recognize that the very molecules that make up your body the atoms that construct the molecules are traceable to the crucibles that were once the centers of high-mass stars that exploded their chemically rich guts into the galaxy, enriching pristine gas clouds with the chemistry of life so that we are all connected to each other biologically, to the Earth chemically, and to the rest of the universe at, uh, atomically. That's kind of cool. That makes me smile, and I actually feel quite large at the end of that. <laughs> it's not that we are better than the universe. We are part of the universe. We are, par we are in the universe, and the universe is in us. We are, as Carl Sagan said, we are star stuff. We are here, and our planet is here, and all of the physical world is here because of the explosion of these high-mass stars that spewed the basic elements of organic chemistry into the universe. Prior to the explosion of that first high-mass star, there was only hydrogen and a little bit of helium and a smidgen of lithium. And we all know lithium, right? Lithium Smartphones wouldn't be if we didn't have lithium. But out of the high-mass stars came carbon, oxygen, plutonium. <laughs> Everything in the periodic table is the result of the explosion of these high-mass stars. Well, the interconnectedness that we have physically with the universe is something that we just don't pay attention to. We are star stuff. Well, going a step beyond that then, beyond that atomically or atomically, uh, uh, atomical, <laughs> atomic relationship, ooh, atomic relationship with the universe, we also have the origination of the uh, sentient being on this planet. Now, there is debate, there is a minority view that the arising of biology on this planet, while it was nurtured by the chemicals that were present on this planet, that it actually arose because of interstellar migration of single-celled animals, single-celled organisms. So it could be, again, minority view, it could be that what we experience here on Earth is really, as life, is really uh, arising from the same germ of life organisms that traveled through interplanetary space. Now that's kind of hard to envision because we lose track of how much time that could ha we could have to have that happen. It's, it's a, uh, a theory of panspermia and this idea that life is abundant in the universe 
arising from these single cell organisms that had traveled and landed on our planet. Now we do know that such things as Mars. Mars is present here on our Earth in little clumps of meteoroids. They are, uh, Mars had been pummeled. <coughs> Earth, of course, has been pummeled. Uh, in fact, the moon is the result of the Earth being pummeled by a Mars-sized planet, and that's really the debris from that collision, or part of the debris. But when Mars was hit by asteroids, it spewed out stuff, and that some of that stuff eventually fell to Earth. And, in fact, there are uh, significant reasons to believe that these individual rocks, some of which were found on the ice of Antarctica, some were found in the ice of the Arctic, that these individual rocks were, in fact, originally with Mars. So the interconnectedness of the planets in this solar system is pretty much without doubt. But then we go to... Then we go to this idea of consciousness. Okay, we, we're interrelated physically, but let's look at consciousness itself. And as I said, consciousness is, is a problem. It's a problem for scientists. It's a problem for philosophers. It, this is offered, uh, well, the, uh, the definition of consciousness as we get into this, the state of being awake and aware of one's surroundings and another definition adds, and of oneself. So we look at this problem of consciousness. And uh, Robert Lanza in Biocentrism offers us this. The Nobel laureate physicist Steven Weinberg concedes that there is a problem with consciousness and that although it may have a neural correlate, that is, it has some uh, relationship to the brain, its existence does not seem to be derivable from physical laws. As Emerson has said, it contradicts all experience. And the quote from Emerson is, here we find ourselves suddenly, not in a critical speculation, but in a holy place, and should go very warily and reverently. We stand before the secret of the world, there where being passes into appearance and unity into variety. We talk about our unity with all beings, but we also see that you and you and you and you and you, obviously, we are all different packages of beingness walking this planet. And we are different packages of consciousness. That is, we each have our own experience. We he each have our own uh, library of perceptions. We each have the correlating meanings of those perceptions. And we build our experience. We build our consciousness from this experience. And the consciousness itself is part and parcel and the foundation of that experience. How many of you are dog owners or cat owners? Now, of those of you that raised your hand, uh, how many of you do not think that those animals are conscious? Pretty universal agreement among dog and cat owners that these beings have a level of consciousness at least as high as us, and with cats, probably higher. <laughs> um, but we have... Uh, in our households, we have examples of consciousness that is not in human form. There's a story of uh, a, a woman who had a boa constrictor, and she was so enamored with this boa constrictor that she slept with it. And over the course of uh, many months, she noticed that the boa constrictor, uh, uh, over the course of, of, of a month, she noticed that the boa constrictor was suddenly losing weight. And she was very concerned about that, took the boa into the, the uh, uh, vet, and the vet said, well, um, tell me about this. Uh, you're, you, how long have you had this? And, you know, what do you feed it? And 
uh, when did you notice this? And uh, so she related that she was sleeping with the boa and that she fed it this and that uh, this happened over the course of the last month. And the, and the vet said, well, here's what I know about boa constrictors and any large snake for that matter is that when they uh, sense that there is a large meal available to them, they will lose weight to make room for it. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> there, is, there is evidence of consciousness, right? There is evidence of understanding of surroundings and knowing self to the extent that it says, you know, I'm not large enough for that meal yet, or I'm not small enough for that meal. Uh, I will be large enough when I lose some weight and goes into this. Now, one could say, well, that's probably instinctual. But I would say to that woman, get that snake in a cage. Um, but here we have an example. And whether you go to domestic animals of cows or pigs or horses, you're going to see some level of consciousness. And to one extent or another, some aware awareness of self. Okay, let's drop out of the animal kingdom and go down into the plant kingdom. Biologists have, have recognized that trees have a means of communicating. I'm not exactly sure how. Certainly with aspen groves, we know that that is just one being. That is just one organism that has many different shoots up. But we also, uh, they, they also have identified uh, groves of trees that are indeed separate. That is, they, are, they arise from seeds that land on the ground. And the root systems are not interconnected. They certainly occupy space, but they are not talking to each other. They don't think. But when a herd of ungulates like giraffes or tree, other tree browsing animals come through, and this, this was a study that was found in the savannas of Africa, that when these browsing ungulates come through and they start they start eating off the trees, that all of the trees in that area of that same species begin creating a fluid, a, a, uh, a fluid that causes the leaves to be undesirable. So a whole grove, a whole community of trees will respond to make their leaves undesirable. Now, what does that say? That says that the trees are at least in communication with each other. They, therefore, are aware of their environment. They're aware of a interloper. <laughs> and they are responsive to the conditions of the environment. Are they self-aware? Don't know. And so it... We're, we're at the borderline of consciousness. Well, this problem of how is it that consciousness arises, there's no physical basis, there's no physical laws that describe how consciousness arises, but we are here testament to the idea, to the fact, that we are each conscious. While we may think, yeah, that person's not quite so conscious, but uh, um, and <laughs> for me, I'm not conscious all the time, but we have this realization, this experience of consciousness, but it, there's no physical laws for it. So this idea of consciousness arising from the physical, if there is a relationship there, we don't know it yet. So that gives us opportunity to speculate. And there are there is speculation that consciousness arises 
from the neural activity and only the neural activity of the brain. That's over on this end of the spectrum. Then as we move to this end of the spectrum, there is the concept that consciousness is in and of itself present. That is, it is not, it, it's not dependent upon physical laws. That consciousness in and of itself is an aspect of the created universe. And so if that is the case, what is the basis for that? Well, here there are two approaches. One is that uh, you, you may be familiar with, with uh, quantum uh, physics and the idea that there is a um, that there is a particle or there is a wave it depends upon whether or not there is an observer if there is an observer noticing that wave particle that they call it the wave function if there is an observer noticing that wave function it will collapse into a particle and if there is no observer, then it stays in a wave function. And it is um, <laughs> it's one of the great paradoxes of quantum physics. But quantum physics is the most tested and the most proved physical uh, set of physical laws that we have encountered, or if you will, established. So this idea of consciousness as being an uh, inherent aspect of creation versus consciousness being uh, something that arises as a result of and codependent with the collapse of this wave function to a particle, that is uh, a whole body of speculation, of uh, philosophical speculation. What is important is that consciousness is very likely present in all beings, maybe all plants, maybe even down to the particle level. The second concept that, they, that philosophers are, physicists and philosophers, and there's actually an a interleaving of those two disciplines, uh, that they're discussing is that each, each individual atomic particle, subatomic particle, has some aspect of consciousness associated with it. That is just the fact that there is a particle there. There is some aspect of consciousness. And that as you combine these particles, there is the combination of consciousness so that as you rise from the very elemental to the very complex organisms, such as most of us, that, that there is a uh, continued combination of consciousness. Now, this gets to the point where we appreciate that, well, wait a minute. If, if there is a combination that occurs as each particle comes together into a higher order organism or a higher order structure, if there is a combination of consciousness that occurs and we get greater and greater consciousness with greater and greater combination, kind of like a cumulative effect on consciousness, then, wow, when we look at a cat or we look at a boa or we look at a Paramecium, right, a, a single-celled organism, that if there is consciousness there, how do we relate to it? How do we interact with it? Does that mean that we uh, change from vegetarian or from uh, uh, carnivore to vegetarian? Well, maybe. I mean, that may be your motivation. Recognizing, of course, that uh, all animals feed on other organisms, whether they be plant organisms or animal organisms, and that even the plant organism, if we recognize the relationship of groves of communities of trees, that we may in fact be 
devouring a conscious being, even in a spear of asparagus, then we can step back and lose our guilt a little bit and just appreciate that we are part of a vast web of consciousness. And in that realization of us being part of that vast web, realizing, if we use the definition of God as consciousness itself, realizing that our interaction with this web, while we may be a consumer of part of that consciousness, having a reverence for that which we consume, like the indigenous uh, peoples across the planet, having a reverence for what they eat, having a reverence for how they are protected by their environment, having a reverence even for those that prey upon them, the tigers, the mountain lions, the bears, having a reverence for all of creation puts us into what Emerson referred to as a holy place. Can you feel it? Can you feel that shift where we're no longer just going to go out and buy a steak and grill that puppy and get it medium rare and throw on some sauce and have some asparagus and maybe some salad and sit down and chow down. If we sit down in a blessing of the food, giving reverence to that which is sustaining us, then it may not be necessary for us to give up bacon. We may, in fact, be able to still enjoy bacon, guilt-free, if we allow ourselves that moment of reverence, that moment of blessing of that which we are provided. That's not to say I would suggest that you devour your significant other, that comes into laws of the land. But nonetheless, we can have reverence for all of creation. We can walk in the sacred space. We can be in that consciousness of the holy. And when Jesus offered us this, in Luke, once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and he answered, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. This universal, this consciousness of which we are a part is within us. It's not out there. It's within us. And, it is out there. It's not an either or. It is a this and. So having this sense of reverence, knowing that you are walking in the sanctuary, the holy sanctuary of consciousness, knowing that you are part and parcel of this whole web allows us to move out of the profane into the sacred. Being in the state of the sacred, each moment, each breath, recognizing that we are truly the children of the Most High, the expressions of God in this moment. And it is our responsibility to practice it. We'll have our meditation. As we allow our breath to bring us into the awareness of the all that is all. To be aware of each and every relationship we have. 
with all of the sentient beings in our environment, but also with all of the other aspects of our experience. If we can just acknowledge for the moment, throw it up as a trial, acknowledge the sacredness of each and every aspect of creation. Acknowledge that the essence of God is in each and every aspect of creation. Feel how that feels. Feel the essence of that awareness of God. Feel that holiness, the holiness of the moment. And acknowledge that it's not that you are creating the holiness of the moment, but you are opening yourselves up to the holiness of the moment. That the moment itself is sacred space. that every aspect of your experience that is present in that holy moment is sacred. It is an expression of God. Whether it be in those things that we judge good or those things that we judge bad, let the holy moment embrace it all because it does. Of course, in miracles, it defines the holy instant as that awareness in which we recognize that we need nothing to realize God. That every aspect of the moment is an expression of God. Every sentient being is a jewel in Indra's net. A reflection of all of creation. A reflection of every aspect of our experience. So we, when we look upon another, whether that other be human or animal or plant, recognize it as an expression of the sacred. We are blessed. And as we bring that experience of blessing back into this time and space, let us share the words of Alleluia. 